الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم لا علمنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما فكا في الدين يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته لك تبوكم يوعى تونا سيشن فرم ده حديث of the collection of Imam Manawi Rahimullah and this is hadith number 14 regarding the blood of a Muslim and its sacredness. So inshallah without any further ado let us begin the recitation of the hadith. An Ibn Mas'ud radhi an qal qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yahillu dam umri'in muslimin illa bi ahda thalath athayyibu zani wa nafsu bin nafs وَتَارِكُ لِدِينِهِ الْمُفَارِكُ لِلْجَمَاعَةِ رَوَاهُ الْبُخَارِيُّ وَمُسْلِمِ On the authority of Ibn Mas'ud Rada'an who said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the blood of a Muslim is unlawful unless it or he belongs to one of three. A married person who does adultery, a life for a life, and the one who is a deserter of his religion abandoning the community and this is related متفقن عليه ريليد إن دي صحيحين of Al Bukhari and Muslim. So we've discussed the life of Ibn Masud in the previous hadith. This is hadith number four, if you recall. And as much as we can add to the the great personality and the great example of Ibn Masud Rahman, we're gonna go forward and hit the introduction, inshallah, of this beautiful hadith. So. It's important also to go back into the history of Islam uh, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ before he actually received the wahi to have a better perspective on this hadith because before the arrival of Islam, for example, human life had little value. An individual could be killed for very silly reasons and uh, there was a lot of tribalism and basically a person could be killed because of revenge for, for example, one's tribe. The killing also of newborn baby girls was rampant in a common evil practice during the time of the Prophet ﷺ because of the shame of having a daughter born into the family. But of course, Islam raised that. And of course, everyone is equal, irrespective of gender, irrespective of color or social status. So the arrival of Islam into the Arabian heartland, to the Hejaz, came with the idea that every single human being is sacred. No life can be violated unless if there is a legitimate cause when there is a serious violation of the Sharia, like when there is a serious crime which occurs, then only because of transgression of the sanctified law. So Islam has placed the authority also into the hands of the highest authority, and that is the Qadi or the judge or at the time of the Khulaf al-Rashidin, would be the Khalifa who would be also the Qadi, the highest in authority, politically, religiously. And it was only after the Khulaf al-Rashidin, for example, after Umar bin Abdul Aziz, then we had the split into political rulers and religious rulers and religious leaders. But in general, um, it's, it's basically the Qadi who makes that decision whether a life is taken because of a transgression, a serious transgression of the law. And what this does also, this prevents capital punishment from being authorized by any other individual in society. Because we have, again, you have the political leader. Uh, you know, you have, they may have hatred towards a certain person, or certain groups. And so the fact that the one who is the highest in terms of knowledge has this authority, this prevents the unjust taking of life outside the scope of the Sharia and also disallows there to be any type of killing or death 
without any due process. So this is very important. When you don't have a just society, then it's useless. Then human life actually does not have value. And unfortunately, this is what we're seeing with these tyrants who are rampant in the Muslim Ummah, who think that they can do whatever they want with any life as they please. And it could be also the West where indiscriminate bombing, innocent people being killed, because every life is sacred. So, where the Prophet says, لا يحل دم امرئن مسلم إلا بإحدى ثلاث The sanctity of life is a very important principle which comes directly from this hadith. Islam, no doubt, is a very peaceful religion and it has established rules where people respect one another and we live together in harmony without being threatened. And so Islam has established rules and regulations of the community which further deters the need for any type of capital punishment or exemplary punishment. And of course, the deen also has rules which regulate the relationships in a Muslim society. And if these rules are observed, then it is very unlikely that the law will be breached. And that's the whole purpose. They are there so that the law cannot be breached and society can flourish. That's the whole reason why we have laws. That's why we have penal codes and punishments. So that the society overall can be peaceful, that people can live in prosperity and they don't have to worry or look behind their backs. And it's important also to note that the Prophet وسلم, during the last sermon of his farewell hajj, he emphasized the sacredness of the blood of a Muslim. He said, فَإِنَّ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ حَرَامٌ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي شَحْرِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا and this is narrated by Abu Bakr in Sahih al-Bukhari where Rasulullah said, Verily your blood, your property is sacred and inviolable as the sacredness of this day of yours, in this month of yours, in this town of yours, until the day you meet your Lord. Okay, so this is the, the sanctity and the, the worth of the blood of a Muslim and every Muslim, regardless of color, race, background, and even regardless of religiosity. The person, the Muslim, may even be a sinner, but yet, as long as he says, La ilaha illallah, his blood is sacred. Again, except with those three cases, which we'll inshallah get into. So, Islam encourages Muslims to avoid any type of transgression or injustice that will lead to a violation of the sanctity of a Muslim. And that's the whole purpose for this hadith. You have to have, you have to take the positive spin and not the negative spin. If you have a negative spin, then you're going to go down the road that Islam is ma'adullah, a violent religion. And that's certainly the opposite. And also this hadith shows the importance not to shed the blood of a Muslim or come close to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> He says, but whoever kills a believer intentionally, his compense will be hell. If and he will abide therein eternally. And Allah will become angry with him and has cursed him and has prepared for him a great punishment. Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 93. And this is a very, very important ayah. We need to be very familiar with this ayah because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the one who kills a believer intentionally, then his recompense is Jahannam. Khalidina fiha. But of course, there is a way out if major tawbah is done. But yet, still, a great punishment. You know, Khawadin Afiya, he will be in hellfire for a long, long time. Not only that, wa ghadib Allahu alayh. And the anger and wrath of Allah will be on him. And not only that, wa la'anah. And, his, and he has cursed him. Okay. And his recompense, and he's prepared for him. A great punishment. You can be the, the most powerful ruler and king, but that is not give you any right to shed the blood of a Muslim. So don't even dare. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this. Okay. 
No excuses. Anyone who says La ilaha illallah, it is only the Qadi who can decide capital punishment for a Muslim. And that is done in those three cases. So, brotherhood and love between Muslims greatly reduces the amount of hatred and enmity in a society. And this also automatically results in the reduction of conflict and killing. And this is huge. Okay, this is huge. Okay, and prevention is better than cure. And that's the whole reason also for applying these very few exemplary punishments to deter these great evils from happening and also for the greater good of the society at large. The shaitan can make anything look anything bad look good if your heart is deviated. If your heart is sahih, then you will not be, your vision will not be narrowed. You will have the proper foresight, you will have a, a broad focus, you will be able to see things macroscopically and also microscopically. So the topic of exemplary punishment, because the Prophet some says, again these three cases, So as I mentioned before, this needs to be understood from a positive viewpoint, that it is not permissible to kill a Muslim except in one of these three outstanding cases. The fact that these three cases are exceptional cases shows that the blood of a Muslim is pressured and blessed by Allah Azawajal. It is also important to note that in the history of Islam, such as during the Khulafa Rashidin or during the time of the Prophet wasallam, that there were only a few cases where such violations occurred. Very important. Okay. So if one looks at this hadith or similar hadith negatively from the anti-Islam viewpoint, from the Islamophobe viewpoint. And these exceptional cases of had, which is the exemplary punishment in Islam, that's a term, they may be easily condemned as severe or cruel. However, in Islam, these few exemplary punishments are actually necessary measures to prevent Muslim society from great evils. And Islam takes that necessary step to make sure that evil is minimized. So, exemplary punishment for one person, two protect the sanctity of the whole community. So by employing exemplary punishment for a select few handful, the livelihood and the sanctity and the security of millions is preserved. Okay. And thus, through this, Islam promotes actually the highest in morality, fidelity and chastity in society. And this is the point of this hadith. Okay. The point is not the punishment. And we have to understand that in terms of the penal code, it consists of approximately 0.5% of Sharia law. 0.5%. Only a few ayat from the Quran which can't even fill a page of the Quran out of the numerous pages of the Quran. Islam is painted from Fox News and all these other channels and media outlets where the haq is completely obscured and they focus on these things out of context, completely out of context to give the broader audience, the negative version about this religion. I mean, many people don't even think of Muslims as people. They think of them as savages or subhuman creatures because they, they haven't ever met a Muslim before in their life. This is what they're taught, what the media is telling them. This is what their friends and teachers are also teaching them as well. This is what the history books are painting, this picture of Islam. But we, as Muslims at Da'i, we have to give them the proper image of Islam through our actions, we have to tell them as much as possible by Islam. So this is the principle of exemplary punishment in Islam. It is basically there to promote the highest in morality, fidelity, and chastity in the society at large. So we talked about the sacredness of a Muslim from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ also, what he mentioned on the day of Arafah in the farewell pilgrimage. Now we turn to the second point, which is al-tayyib al-zani. Okay. So, not only does Islam prevent bloodshed and chaos and hatred by employing this had punishment, many societies also have capital punishment. Some cities in the United States also have that as well. I mean, this is not something which is unique to Islam. In the Bible also is that as well. Well, the institution of marriage is sacred in Islam. And it plays a central role in society. It causes stability in the society, having strong, righteous families. And going back to paraphrasing that 
hadith regarding the shaitan about who he loves the most in terms of his, his companions and those who follow him. The one who can break the marriage, the shaitan places him at a high status okay, among other people who create fitna in society. So if you ruin the marriage by, for example, divorce or whatnot, this is something which is uh, such a big blow in general to the society because this is at the core of society, the marriage, okay, the zawaj. So, marriage is very important. This is why it cannot be fragmented or destroyed by things such as adultery, which completely decays marriage, which is the opposite and antithesis of marriage. Okay. So, at Thayyib Ozani, this punishment safeguards the appropriate relationships between men and women and discourages actions that lead to zina or adultery. Again, preventing, remember, do not even go near adultery. Right? Do not even go near adultery. This is what the Quran says. Because it is a very slippery slope. It starts basically by a glance and it, then the people slip and then, ma'adullah, there is this great haram which is committed which just completely ruins the lives of many people. Okay? Not just the people who engaged in marriage and chastity because their kids, their families which, which are involved. It's an embarrassing situation for everyone around them as well. May Allah protect us from this great evil. Okay. There's other values also which the marriage preserves. And this is modesty and iffa. Okay. Modesty and chastity. Okay. Haya. Okay. And these unfortunately are devoid in modern Western culture. And this is very important. Okay. The whole purpose of hijab and zawaj and these things is to preserve the dignity of the woman and preserve chastity and modesty in our lives. Okay, because we're not animals. We are much more higher and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us for a greater purpose and has allowed us the halal way to interact between genders. And this is of course through marriage. So these values are important and essential in maintaining respect and decency between the opposite genders. And unfortunately today, in contemporary times, these values are being denigrated because of the evils of promiscuity and lewdness being promoted by the media and technology. I mean, even in Muslim lands, this is happening, unfortunately. You know, dissipation of haya. I was watching a video, and it's really shameful. I mean, even where one of the princes of Saudi Arabia, big business or whatnot, and he had secretaries, and then their dress code, this is in Saudi Arabia. Their dress code was a mini skirt. Their dress code was a mini skirt. No hijab. This is a prince of Saudi Arabia. Where the Prophet ﷺ, 1400 years, has uh, established the way, the hijab, and you have this going on. It's just very shameful. And they were having a documentary. I mean, there were some pro Islamic things as well, but it was just, I mean, to. In a country where you have Islamic law, this is the maqam of those who are keepers of the haramain, that these things cannot be going on. Okay? So, in our Islamic societies, we have to ensure that we have the proper dress code, maintain respect and decency between opposite genders, do not have free mixing. I mentioned to you Imam Salih Talib, one of the Imams of Makkah, he was talking about the dangers of free mixing and just for doing that, put in jail. So may Allah protect the sanctity of Muslims everywhere. And the last example of the exemplary punishment, this hadith which where the Prophet says, وَالتَّارِكُ لِدِينِهِ الْمُفَارِكُ لِلْجَمَاعَ Basically, the one who apostates against Islam, the one who declared himself a Muslim or herself a Muslim and now basically goes against that. But, as we discussed this, so this was also a concept mentioned in the previous books as well. Okay, and again, uh, I just want to highlight the hypocrisy of those who direct their attacks against Islam, particularly in the, these few handful had punishments. So in an ideal Islamic society, knowledge of Islamic teachings is widespread and accessible. Thus, the community is knowledgeable and understands their religion along with the obligations.
Okay. So when the knowledge is widespread, then this in and of itself will deter people from major sins, including those that have had punishments. Furthermore, knowledge also protects the minds from doubt and the manipulation from external influences and ideologies. Note that, in general, the Muslim gets deviated in two different ways, shubuhat and shahawat. Shubuhat are the doubts, and this is the most dangerous of the two, and shahawat are the desires. Okay? And they all feed off each other. The more you have doubt, you'll cave into your desire. And the more you cave into your desire, eventually doubts also will enter your heart and mind as well regarding the haq. It's very important to protect yourselves in terms of shubuhat and shahawat. Okay. And knowledge is the thing which repels shubuhat. It repels doubt and promotes one to be mindful of the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the more we read the Quran, the more we learn about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more we are inculcated with the haq, the more it becomes part of us. And that's why it's so important to gain the knowledge because it just protects our minds, it elevates our iman as well. And it also allows to promote us to deter ourselves from shahawat, the desires as well. So the more we gain knowledge, the more we are also encouraged to do good things and doing good deeds also deters and pushes away from the desires. Okay. Makes our stamina more, increases ourselves in terms of sabr so we can do the obligations and protect ourselves in terms of doing the haram actions as the ones which are detailed in this hadith. So from such a society, for someone to commit apostasy would be extremely rare. Ya'ni, an ideal, strong Islamic society. And this is already set up to minimize these few exceptional crimes when the taking of a life is actually sanctioned. Okay. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the trend is very high. In atheism, you have materialism, and materialism is really feeding into atheism. And this is also, unfortunately, affecting many Muslims. Many Muslims who are in the academic circles, they are unfortunately influenced by philosophy and these things which cause them to have doubt in the deen. You know, the haq is there. You know, the haq is there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one can doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. And yet, because of their short-sightedness, because of them caving into their desires, you know, it causes them to have doubt in shubuhat and the deen, these other ideologies, even the history, unfortunately, is so tainted. And you know, even in the history books, for example, there's only a couple of pages in the history books which are taught to high school students about Islam and its greatness, while much of it is emphasizing Western hegemony. So it's unfortunate. You know, history is really his story, and we have to know our story. And subhanAllah, this ummah is an ummah of scholars. We've had so many ulama, so much of our writing is trapped in these great volumes in Arabic in, in terms of our history. We should go back to that as well. We need to go back. So it's unfortunate that the current trends, the high rise of atheism and materialism, and I mean, atheism really is just a legitimacy. You just do whatever you want. I mean, if you're an atheist, everything is okay. Everything is okay. And that's unfortunately why people are caving into atheism because they just want to legitimize their desires, basically become the god. Okay, this is what happens in atheism. Anything can go. There's no law whatsoever in atheism. Okay. And perhaps this is why it's become so popular. And it's extremely dangerous. And we have to protect ourselves and protect our kids and increase them in their knowledge and the haq so that we can protect ourselves from going into the pit and in internal damnation. So trending to another regarding exemplary punishment in the Bible, this is not a new principle to Islam, and it's found in the former books. This is not the basis for our iman and faith, but this is important as a da'wah tool. You have to also, when you're doing da'wah, also be prepared as well. So if there's someone who is from the Ahl kitab who is attacking you, and they're there just to put Islam down, you have to not just be sucker punched and not be thrown under the bus. And this is why we also have to know the tenets from the previous book as well. And again, part of, right, we look at Hadith Jibreel, part of the Iman is also believing in the books which were sent down. Of course, the books, unfortunately, like the Old and New Testament, they've been altered and changed. But those things which are still remnants in there are a testification that there's still tenets which were not changed. Okay, 
So let's look at some of these. And again, the reason why we're mentioning this is that unfortunately, those Islamophobes who attack the Islam are often from the people of the book. And it's amazing that they are I mean, hypocrites because many of the attacks on Islam are founded on labels of it being brutal, a bloodthirsty religion, or against homosexuality, for example, or barbaric or unjust against women. But the truth is that if they look at it in that way, then Christianity and Judaism is actually, from a textual standpoint, then you can just go to the Old Testament or the New Testament. And it actually has more brutality and because of the verses that it contains. So, for example, the Old Testament, it commands the death penalty for various acts, which is murder, again, like Exodus 21, 12, kidnapping even, okay, things as adultery, the death penalty has been laid down in Leviticus 20, 10, I guess homosexuality again, it's pretty clear, it's in fortunate that this is becoming a norm, but it's clearly a major, major sin, and it should be treated as such. Okay. Also, for things such as prostitution and rape, it's also death is ordained as well in the Bible. Okay. Nothing new. Nothing new. Okay. And in Leviticus 24.16, you have the verse that, and he that blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Again, apostasy. And all the congregation shall stone him, as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land when he blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. Well, blasphemy or apostasy, what is the punishment here in the Bible? What is the punishment? It is death. So why are we being put under the bus? Right? This is not a new principle. Also, if there be found among you that has gone and served other gods, Right and worship them, then, then again, stoned to death. Okay, this is basically someone who goes to do shirk. Then, what's the punishment? And this is also ordained in Surah Baqarah, when Musa Islam found his people worshiping the calf. So, mother commanded them to faktulu and fusakum, kill yourselves. Yani, you have to kill. It's as if you're killing yourselves. Kill those who who worship the calf, who did the shirk. This was the punishment for Bani Israel and as per Tafsir, there were basically 100,000 or more from Bani Israel who were killed. And this was at the hands of their family members. Okay, a punishment laid down by Musa a.s. for committing transgression to do shirk after you were believers. This is not a new principle to Islam. Apostasy, this is not a new principle. Again, this can only be ordained and done by the Khalifa or the Qadi. Another verse, Deuteronomy 13, 5 to 10 again, and in Corinthians 11, even regarding the hijab, look at the hijab as well, the commandment to do hijab in the Bible. Okay, they always blame us, right? And this is a beautiful thing to cover the hair in terms of humbleness, in terms of chastity and modesty and haya, and again, double standard. So always a double standard. So in Corinthians 11, verse 4 to 6, But every wife who prays with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair, let her cover her head. So this is, again, a commandment from the Bible, ordainment for women to do hijab, as Muslims, we respect the, these laws which were laid down in the Old Testament and New Testament from the previous nations. But why, again, are we thrown under the bus every time when there's a discussion? Because we adhere to our religion and we don't do double standards. You know, we, we don't play games with our religion, our deen. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh, you who believe, enter into the religion completely. Yani, we can't pick and choose. We have to enter into Islam completely and do not follow the footsteps of shaitan. Shaitan wants us to swerve, be it one law, one thing from the religion. We have to take all of it all together, all of it. So, Trending now and transitioning to 
the next topic from this beautiful hadith, which is challenges to Muslim society, mass media. Okay. So one major challenge is the media, which includes the entertainment industry and also the internet as well. These modalities are being used to promote evil behavior and make evil appear normal. Okay. And that's again the antithesis of this hadith. The whole purpose of hadith punishments is to dissuade people from transgressing the sanctity of a Muslim or life in general. Because even, it's not just about Muslim life, it's about life in general. Every life is precious. During jihad, even the Muslim army cannot even cut a tree down. This is how important it is even against a tree. Okay. So, it's very important we are aware of mass media, how it's trying to skew good behavior and make it appear evil, and how it's trying to normalize evil behavior. And to the point where even good behavior is trivialized and often mocked and ridiculed. And from this, the media promotes those actions that this hadith declares as exceptional evils. Right? Number one, violence and murder. Number two, adultery and fornication. Number three, apostasy. In Western religious discussion, Ma'adullah, there's even, they make fun of God. They have jokes of God. We cannot do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lafdul jalali, even the name of Allah, we don't refer to the name of Allah as something in terms of Arabic grammar. We refer to it as lafdul jalala, you know, the, the grand name. This is the respect we have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His book, His messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the high level. We cannot lower ourselves and lower our standards to that which unfortunately Western society is, is trickling down to. If you go back to American society also, there was a high level of respect in terms of family, in terms of society as well, but unfortunately it's deteriorated to the point where now it's all about materialism, it's all about fulfilling your desires, and what this does is this trivializes religion, this trivializes manners, this trivializes the morale of society in general, irrespective of whether you're a Muslim or not a Muslim. So the Influence of the media has seeped deep into Muslim society today and many negative effects. It is also related to higher rates of violence, divorce, adultery, and even apostasy within the various Muslim communities across the globe. So we need to deal with these challenges with great care and without ignoring the underlying principles behind this and other ahadith. Going further. So the leaders and the du'at, the which is the plural of uh, da'i, the preachers of our Muslim community need to determine as how to counter and minimize the negative influences of the media, especially the internet, especially social media, and also television as well. And we need to pay special attention to protecting the minds and also the akhlaq of the youth because they are the most susceptible to be influenced from these modalities. Well, there's much research which also has been done over the past few decades which shows the negative influence of the media, especially television. I mean, studies show that television makes children physically and mentally lazy. Furthermore, it also alters the behavior and deters their academic progress. I mean, for example, you look at CEOs, putting religion aside, CEOs, the ones who are at the highest level in terms of a society from a business standpoint. I mean, the amount of TV they look at or watch is so minuscule compared to the masses. The TV that they watch is often related to their own area of expertise. So we should try to avoid uh, watching TV, minimize this because it's a great waste of time and basically it's a way where you become passive sponges for evil concepts and things which just make us susceptible, our hearts, our minds susceptible to falsehood. And not only that, it also makes us physically and mentally lazy as well. Another problem also in contemporary Muslim societies and communities is the lack of support and financial resources as well. Often when uh, there's, there's a lot of needy who are desperate for financial help and other resources, and unfortunately they find little hope from the Muslim community. And in some cases, you know, we have Christian missionaries who take advantage of the situation in countries and offer both financial and spiritual assistance. Uh, we have to be cognizant of you know, these trends as well, which are happening in the Muslim world and beyond. So, the next topic is the Muslim identity. Again, this also relates to, you know, apostasy and the high level of Muslims, unfortunately, who are, you know, having doubt. I mean, sometimes you run into a Muslim who says they're, quote-unquote, not religious. 
you know what that's a red flag for, right? Basically, that they have doubt in Islam, that they're barely Muslim. Because when someone says they're not religious, often that's the case. They don't pray at all. They have doubt in terms of Islam. They're not really connected to the Ummah in terms of heart and mind. Okay, so we have to be very careful. If you identify yourself from other points of reference, then Islam is overshadowed. Okay, and this is also made difficult by you have certain Muslims uh, or quote-unquote Muslims who are striving to promote non-Muslim identities, sectarianism, ideologies, and attachment to ethnic culture. So for example, if you're in high school, if someone's in high school, you have a Muslim student association, but if you go to the Palestinian club or the Egyptian club or the Arab club versus the Muslim clubs, there's some problem with you. If you're going to the Indian student association or the Pakistani student association, well, you're not going to the Muslim association, Muslim student association, I must say, there's a problem with you. There's a problem. Why are you not identifying yourself as a Muslim? What's there to be ashamed about? This is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have been blessed to have been born under this. So these are the issues which our youth are facing and unfortunately they're failing many times in terms of their identity as a Muslim. And now that, even as adults who identify themselves with various parties versus identifying themselves based on religion. And this is just comes out of pan-Arabism, for example, or nationalism. These are ideologies which promote the secular viewpoint that there's separation of church and state. Islam is, is a complete deen. Islam is not about what Muslims do, it's what Muslims are supposed to do. Okay. So when Muslims are doing evil and haram things, then often Muslims and those who are not Muslim, they get this negative association of the haram actions as what Islam is all about. Okay, so there's a multitude of issues that we are doing with, and what happens is that the Muslim identity is lost and tarnished and diluted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran, <laughs> He subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if anyone desires a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted of him. And the hereafter he will be in the ranks of the losers. So, of course, from other cultures and societies like the West, we can of course benefit from their knowledge and technological progress and ideals which are in sync with Islam. However, not at the expense of Muslim or Islamic culture. And again, this is one thing which uh, Islam did, Islam did not just destroy all the other cultures. I mean, it basically adapted to what was good and just filtered out the, the evils or the things which were disallowed in Islam. If we have all these, for example, look at Africa, they maintained their culture, but those other shirky things were dissipated under Islam. The same thing, in, for example, in, in Europe, Asia, the cultures, the languages, they're preserved. But again, Islam filters out the evils and allows the culture to flourish. Alhamdulillah. Another negative influence comes from the academic realm. And we alluded to that the prior slide. We have, unfortunately, Orientalists and certain non-Muslim intellectuals and also Muslim intellectuals. And they have created misconceptions of Islam with which to indoctrinate society with. You know, you have basically their version of Islam. That's the version that we should follow not the version which the ulama, which the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahab and the Salaf have taught and inculcated for us. Okay, so, for example, in terms of the, the exemplary punishments, they would say, oh, you know what, this is like something which is outdated. There's no benefit to it. Islam should go away from this. And in this way, again, they're challenging the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that of the Prophet ﷺ, which has been laid down for us. And what this does is, unfortunately, this has resulted in many Muslims having the improper perception of Islam and embracing Western ideologies in a modern, secularized lifestyle. And many of these Muslims, unfortunately, have become non-practicing, again, not religious. Very dangerous key word there. And they're really on the brink of apostasy. May Allah protect us and guide us and allow us to guide those who are on the brink of apostasy, whose life is devoid of prayer. Again, the 
the salah is so important because this reminds us of la ilaha illallah daily on a daily basis. That we have to get them to go back to the salah and go back to the identity. So highlights from this hadith. This hadith again needs to be viewed in the positive respect. Okay. And from the special emphasis which is placed on human value. Okay. Opponents of Islam incorrectly accuse this hadith and others like it of being, quote, barbaric and bloodthirsty because of their short-sightedness. This attribution is directly contradicting, actually, Islamic values because it does actually the opposite. So you have to not look at this hadith from a negative spin. You have to have the positive, appropriate spin and context regarding this hadith. And remember, often these opponents, they're hypocritical in terms of their own book. It's just basically hypocrisy and again, throwing their books behind their back. In Islam, it has a social system which minimizes the occurrences of these crimes and these three specific exemplary punishments. And furthermore, the execution of these punishments can only be done also by the highest authority in an Islamic state. It can't just be done by the average Abdullah or the Fatima. No one can just take the law into their own hands. No, kalla, no. There has to be due process. Very important. And unfortunately, these times, this is not happening. So we need to have justice in society as the bedrock on which the Sharia law stands on and can be applied. If you don't have justice, then Sharia really cannot be applied. And so thus, justice in society is so huge, particularly in the Muslim lands. May Allah allow us to have just leaders and those who have the proper sincerity. Ameen. So having these laws in place allows for the prevention of greater evils in society and the elevation of many great human values. These laws highlight the high regard for human life, chastity, and fidelity. Unfortunately, in contemporary times, you know, the values such as chastity and fidelity have been belittled. Muslim society needs to protect itself from influences that weaken Islamic values and morale and also dilute the Muslim identity. So without these values, again, the morality and conduct and akhlaq of people will deteriorate. And society also, as a result, will deteriorate. And so many parts of the Muslim world today, the value for human life, specifically the, the life of a Muslim, has become so cheap. And it's important we have the proper application and also internalization of this hadith, which will also neutralize much of the violence and killing which is rampant and prevalent in our lands. In other places also we have the loss of chastity, haya, and the, also the undermining of the institution of marriage. This hadith aims to strengthen chastity, marriage, and families and thus keep the bedrock of society strong. Okay. So altogether, you know, from this hadith and the other hadith in this collection, we need to strengthen Islamic values at different levels. And there are so many challenges that the contemporary Muslim community faces today and also in the near future. And the whole purpose of this hadith, the exemplary punishments, is again to pave the way to enhancing the ideals of human life, ideals of marriage and chastity, and ideals also of fidelity in Islam. So we need to revive the original Islamic values and morale in a way that is practical also in today's Muslim world. And the du'at, the da'i, the teachers, the ulama also need to exert their influence on the society and particularly with special attention to the, the youth, to our youth, because they're the most vulnerable in terms of having the wrong perception of Islam and a lack of knowledge. We also need to protect them from the media and also these new uh, modalities which have a significant danger as well. And many of the ideals that they're promoting are opposed to the Islamic value system. Okay. So these are some questions which will hopefully be a litmus test for your understanding for the principles which were laid out from this hadith and the shar. Jazakallah khairan for your attendance. May Allah give us tawfiq from what we have listened and heard today. Subhanakallahu hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ila illa anth wa sakafu wa tubu wa ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.